Hello everyone. Today we're going to discuss the short story, The Debutante. I think this story is hilarious. I think it's so funny, it makes me laugh out loud, and I have no idea if any of you will feel similarly about it or just think I'm weird. Either way, we're going to look at this story to sharpen our skills in close reading. Which is a good thing because this is another of the short stories that you can write about in your own close reading essay if you want to. So I hope this video will help you to begin to come up with your own interpretation of the debutante. When we discussed the fears of Mrs. Orlando, we looked at how the three perspectives presented in that story came into conflict, leaving you to figure out your own perspective on Mrs. Orlando and as such to begin to develop your own interpretation of the story. In this story, the debutante, we have access to only the limited point of view of the first person narrator, the young woman, the debutante. In this video, I want to discuss what we can figure out about the narrator by studying her narrative voice, by close reading the language she uses. But first, before we turn to the story, I'm going to give you a little context for it. Leonora Carrington was born in 1917 to a really wealthy British family. Like the narrator of the debutante, Carrington was expected to be a debutante a young woman who would make a formal entrance into upper-class fashionable society and probably eventually become the wife of a wealthy man. Also like the narrator of The Debutante, Carrington wanted none of this. She kept getting kicked out of schools for bad behavior, she wanted to be an artist, and she eventually met the famous surrealist painter Max Ernst and moved with him from England to France. They lived in the south of France until the Nazis invaded and arrested Max Ernst, who they believed to be a dangerous, degenerate artist. Carrington fled the Nazi invasion by going to Spain, but while she was there, she had a nervous breakdown and her parents had her institutionalized and given electroshock therapy. She escaped from that and fled to Mexico, where she spent most of the rest of her life writing and painting. Her paintings are really cool and reflect the surrealism of her writing, I think, featuring animal hybrids and dreamlike landscapes. She died in Mexico, actually fairly recently, in 2011, at the age of 94. So that's who Leonora Carrington was. We can of course see some similarities between Carrington and the narrator of the debutante, but they're not the same person. So let's see what we can tell about this narrator from the way she tells her story. Like Mrs. Orlando, the narrator is afraid of something. What is she afraid of? When I was a debutante, she writes, I often went to the zoo. I went so often that I knew the animals better than I knew the girls of my own age. Indeed, it was in order to get away from people that I found myself at the zoo every day. The animal I got to know best was a young hyena. She knew me too. She was very intelligent. I taught her French, and she, in return, taught me her language. In this way, we passed many pleasant hours. My mother was arranging a ball in my honor on the 1st of May. During this time, I was in a state of great distress for whole nights. I've always detested balls, especially when they are given in my honor. The formal ball that's going to be given in her honor is the formal ball at which, as a debutante, she is going to make her formal entrance into upper-class society. She detests balls, especially when they are given in my honor, which suggests, I think, that what's really stressing her out is that this is the ball where she is going to be expected to take up her social role as a young woman of the upper classes who is eventually going to be married to someone else from the upper class. One gets the very clear sense that she has no desire to become a part of this class given that she knew the animals better than she knew the girls of her own age and it was in order to get away from people that she found herself at the zoo every day. I think the question that the story asks, though, is where she really belongs. She clearly identifies with the hyena, which, as an animal, lives outside of the human society she wants to leave. And she seems to want to, in a way, trade places with the hyena. She doesn't only teach the hyena French, she learns the hyena's language and she suggests the hyena go to the ball in her place. There do seem to be similarities between the young woman and the hyena. The young woman and the hyena are the same size, and the young woman says the hyena finds it difficult to walk in my high-heeled shoes. I found some gloves to hide her hands, which were too hairy to look like mine, 
By the time the sun was shining into my room, she was able to make her way around the room several times, walking more or less upright. We can imagine, I think, that the young woman, when she's dressed formally, also feels uncomfortable and like she's in disguise. The hyena herself additionally seems to feel like the narrator. The hyena wants to escape her world for another as well. She wants to go to the ball and get out of the zoo where she's fed bloody rubbish. They both feel uncomfortable in their situations and they're both trying to escape, though in opposite directions. It's sort of a simple fairy tale setup what makes the story interesting, though, and also funny, I think, is the question of the extent to which the young woman really does belong in her social class, and whether she can ever really escape, or whether she even really deep down wants to escape. She might think and feel that she doesn't belong amidst the upper classes, or even among human beings, but if you study her language, you might wonder just how much she has already been shaped by the upper class. She doesn't want to go to the ball, but look at how she expresses this. I've always detested balls, especially when they are given in my honor. That sentiment is not only expressed in formal, educated language. It's also the most condescending, privileged, entitled tone of voice I can imagine. I've always detested balls especially when they are given in my honor. She's suffering, as she says, nights of distress over this. But what's her problem? There's gonna be a big lavish party for her. She might really not want to go, but it suggests she has no idea what kinds of problems people in other social classes face, let alone hyenas. Consider too, when she has to figure out how to give the hyena something like a human face, she immediately agrees to the suggestion that they sacrifice her maid. She guesses the maid can die if that means she can avoid going to a party she doesn't want to go to. What's her hesitation about killing the maid? It's not practical. She'll probably die if she hasn't got a face. Somebody will certainly find the corpse and will be put in prison. In her mind, maids exist, or stop existing, just to make her life easier. She doesn't seem to see the working class as consisting of actual human beings. Her kindness consists in asking the hyena to kill her before tearing off her face. It'll hurt too much otherwise. You wonder, does she really understand what it's like to exist in a world where she isn't surrounded by servants who will do whatever she asks, or whom she can sacrifice if she wants to? All of these tensions come to a head at the end, which is very abrupt, but which, for that reason, leaves you, as the reader, to make sense of the story and what it means. The plan ends in disaster. The hyena cannot fit in. The hyena smells badly and doesn't like the food, so eats the maid's face and jumps out of the window. That might suggest that the young woman, who feels closest to the hyena, really would be unhappy in her social class. She might have been raised in that class, but she will never be able to stand it, given her personality and her interests and desires. But I've always wondered about that bat at the ending. Why is it in the story? Right before her mother comes in to tell her what the hyena did at the party, the narrator is in her room reading Gulliver's Travels when a bat flew in at the window, uttering little cries. I am terribly afraid of bats. I hid behind a chair, my teeth chattering. I had hardly gone down on my knees when the sound of beating wings was overcome by a great noise at my door. My mother entered, pale with rage. The bat, another animal, really freaks her out. It suggests she's not ready to give up the life she's leading. She's scared of the animal world, of the world outside of human society, of things that are unfamiliar to her. So, in the end, what does this story mean? The young woman wants to escape, but lacks the courage? The young woman thinks she wants to escape, but deep down doesn't really? She's never going to be happy in her social class, and if she tries to join it, it will be a disaster like the hyena's attempt? There's no place for her in her social class or outside of it? There's nowhere for her to go? The story ends right there, I think, precisely so that it leaves you asking yourself those questions. There is no right or wrong answer to those questions, Instead, how you answer those questions about the story, based on how you close read the story, will help you to think about and come to your own conclusions about things like social class, human psychology, and the possibility for human beings to change their lives. This is what we're going to build to over the course of this semester. How we can close read a literary text, not just for the sake of analyzing a literary text, 
but to instead close read a literary text to help us think through larger psychological, social, cultural, and philosophical questions.